lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah, good, good. Um, just, uh, well, we we couldn't arrange for um, our return co-host this year, Christmas. They just weren't down very long. But right. we are drinking the whiskey that he gave me for Christmas. I was going to say, so what are we sipping on here? This is uh, Leapers. Lapers? Lipers? I'm not sure. Oh. Uh, Leapers Fork, I'm going to say. It's L-E-I, so it could be a lot of pronunciations. Gotcha. Um, oh. And uh, it, it is a Tennessee-made uh, bourbon. Ah, like it's well, a, a fairly local distillery to where they are. Oh, well, it's, it's very good. It's yeah, yeah. Good choice. I like yeah. it. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a fan. I had a little bit last night, um, and uh, and I, I thought that we, you know, would be appropriate. Yeah. So, but I, GI Greg will make a return at some point. I'm sure. We just <laughs> hadn't been able to work it out. Oh yeah, it'll happen. Yeah. Um, I may just, you know pack up recording stuff and go there <laughs> <laughs> just bring it to him <laughs> yeah um sometime that'd be a fun road trip yeah it would i think so uh we got to pick the appropriate time of year to go to tennessee man isn't all year good in tennessee i thought that was like the sure. stick of tennessee like their weather is always beautiful I don't think that that's true. I, it may not be. <laughs> I, I may just be like pulling that up, <laughs> but I thought that was the case. No, that's California's thing. Is that California's well, thing? Well, it's Southern California's thing. Okay. I don't know. Um, I think it's Tennessee's thing, too. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, I, well, there are maybe, certainly may- better times than others. People go there intentionally in the fall. Yeah. Like, okay. people love falls in Tennessee. Yeah. So. Okay. Maybe that's that's. A and there's a lot time. of parts of Tennessee. Like I'm sure there's parts that have better weather than others. Yeah, and uh, and I'm sure that you can use the excuse of the weather sucks where I am, so I'm <laughs> going to go to Tennessee also. So you yeah. know, summer here might be a good time to go. Well, just about anywhere. Yeah. Oh, agreed with that. Yeah. yeah. So especially if there's a hurricane in the Gulf. <laughs> well, they're not usually in the Gulf in the summer. Well, I guess in July it can start, right? Yeah. Ah, uh, dude, some years they start earlier than that. Yeah. I, guess. I mean, not not every year. I but mean, officially, hurricane season happen. starts June 1st. Yeah, yeah. But but usually it takes a You don't while. really usually see them till the fall. Yeah, generally. Yeah. But it depends on the season. Of course, fall here isn't, isn't <laughs> very fall-like. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And in fact, today... On the penultimate day of 2021, yeah. second to last day of December, yeah. it's 78 degrees outside today. <laughs> I know, man. <laughs> I was like, where's the polar vortex when you need it, man? All right. yeah, we uh, need some cooler weather. Yeah. Oh, we had a little bit, you know, a month ago, and yeah. then it went away. Yeah. We'll get we'll get a cold January, or February, I'm sure. Oh, um, I hope so. Got to kill those mosquitoes, man. Yeah, like no that's kidding. my thing is like we need some good hard freezes so the mosquitoes die. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that's, that's important. Th- that is very <laughs> important, man. A hot summer or a hot winter is not good for uh, the summertime with mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, then they're really competitive, and it's no good when the mosquitoes oh, are really competitive. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Um. Well, uh, <laughs> after that little meandering um let's uh let's talk about the kim potter case okay yeah uh so for those that don't know um kim, kim potter is the uh police officer who thought she was drawing her taser and instead drew her pistol and um and killed the guy yeah dante right that right? I, think, I think so. I'm not. I'm not super sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's the the name of the of the victim here. So, um, you know, we had some things to say about that at the time. Uh, mostly that that's a huge mistake and a severe training issue, and that they need to spend more time training, and that you know there should be some consequences <laughs> for this. Even though uh, we believe that it was in fact an accident. Um, but it's a pretty serious accident. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sometimes accidents have to have consequences behind them. Yeah. I mean, that's just reality. Yeah, well, and it will in this case. Um, so she was uh, convicted on uh, two counts of manslaughter. Um, she will only serve a uh, sentence for one of them, whichever the bigger one that sticks, because, of course, there will still be appeals and so forth. Yeah. Um, now, I, I thought that this was a correct verdict. Yeah. Um, but I, I've come to understand a little bit more about the case, and I realize that um, 
I don't know. Like what they were trying her for isn't really what I thought was going on. And what I thought was going on isn't even what I think should be going on. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, I don't know, this whole thing is, is kind of strange. So the question um, to the jury, apparently, was really about whether it was criminal negligence for her to have um, pulled her sidearm instead of the taser. Yeah. And... Um, and I'm not sure, okay, I, I'm not sure that that's, I don't think that that's the right question. Yeah. <laughs> um, first off. And uh, what I think is the right question, which also isn't the question really that they were asking, um, is uh, was this self-defense? Yeah. Because uh, frankly, I think that this should be tried just like if you or I had done this. Yeah. Right. Now, I understand her job is different, and so that, that creates... Uh, a different um, setting, I suppose, or context in which to determine these things. Yeah. But, um, but that wasn't really the question either. So the question became whether use of force was justified in the situation, which is um, part of what I, I expected to be a uh, question there. And then if that's the case, Actually, some attorneys that I was listening and talked about it said essentially that if they determined that use of force was justified or use of deadly force was justified in that situation, that's kind of the end of it. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Whether she screwed up or not, whether she meant to tase him or shoot him, if if lethal force is justified, yeah. then that that's it. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, I understand that question. Yeah. Um, but I think I, I think that, um, again, I think that they're like people are criminally charged with accidents. Yeah. Um, and this was an accident that re resulted in the death of somebody. And I understand that the circumstances surrounding it make it a more nuanced question about what should be done yeah. um, in this case. But I still think that there should be consequences to her. For making this mistake, because oh. the life was taken away, and it didn't have to be. Exactly. Now it might have ended up that way anyway, because the guy was resisting, and you know, uh, yeah. and it, certainly in the case, they made a strong case that he was putting other people in danger, and so um, there is justification in defending someone else's life as well. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's a lot of questions to ponder in this, but um, I, I think that some of the reactions to it are more what I'm interested in talking about, I guess, at this point. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm not an attorney, so I, I can't yeah. determine the legal, the legal questions. merits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, like, I heard uh, that some police officers were, well, probably a lot of police officers were very <laughs> upset about the verdict, but um, that they were upset. Uh, I heard police officers saying that they were upset because in these kind of situations, that, you know, they have a dangerous job and they have to make split-second decisions, which is, true yeah um i come from a law enforcement family i mean i have some yeah. relation to this I, I haven't been a law enforcement person myself so I, I don't have direct knowledge or understanding of it but um i did have a father that went off to to be a law enforcement yeah. and you wanted agent. him to come home every yeah, day exactly. yeah exactly um so in that question uh you know whether you fire or not um, is a difficult decision, has to be made very quickly. And I certainly uh, understand the position of um, I'd rather be the one shooting than the one shot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, th th these are difficult questions to answer. But um, what some officers were saying was that if they ended up in this situation themselves, that they wanted to feel confident that they would be protected by the apparatus around them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like that thinking. Yeah. No, um, I agree. And because just because you enforce the law doesn't put you above it. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I think any other, any other person would be held accountable in some way for an accident that caught, cost the life of somebody else yeah oh absolutely and so i think that she should too now i'm okay with a light sentence 
Yeah. I mean, I want it to be something that she'll remember. Yeah. Um, I, I want it to be something of a cautionary tale to other police officers that they can't, that yeah. they need to train. They need to be prepared. They need to game these things out. They need to be ready to make the right decision. They need to not make mistakes. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to put on that uniform, particularly because that's kind of what eat, eated me up about this particular case is that she didn't have a, she hadn't really been in very many such in uniform situations was my understanding. She was, had been more in um, like desk work type thing. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, I mean, it, but once you go out on patrol or out in these type of situations, you need to absolutely be prepared for anything that's going to come up. Yeah. Um, and to grab the wrong, I mean, it just blows my mind that somebody could grab the taser instead of the gun. Like, yeah. I mean, and I, I do believe that that's what happened. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think it was, she was, she said one thing and did another. Like, I think that it was truly an accident, but even still, like, I mean, there has to be repercussions for something like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, and there will be. And uh, now they're um, they're looking for a lot of time, I think. They're looking for close to 10 years. Yeah. I don't yeah. think that that's necessary. Well, but even, I'm good with sentencing to 10 because, I mean, what's she going to serve out of that 10 anyway? What, five? Four to six, four yeah. Four to six. I yeah. mean, I'm good with four to six actual years served. Yeah. So, yeah, I would go less than that because I, I think that she has legitimate remorse. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't actually provide a lot of justice. Yeah. For her to serve five years. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, Dante Wright. Uh, well, I mean, this is a problem of the the quote unquote justice system. Anyway, it doesn't yeah. serve anybody but the state and attorneys. Yeah. Um. Well, that's true. But uh, I mean, I would think that a three-year sentence that she serves like 18 months, that would probably, I, oh, I would be okay with that. That's not enough for me. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, not an, that's not enough for me. I, yeah. I, think, I think four to I five I mean, I think that's is, enough to make people, make police officers be more careful. Uh, maybe. And, and, you know, let I, me add something else on this too in terms of police officers making these decisions uh, about uh, whether their life's in danger or not. Like, again... I do go back to the um, the position that I'd rather be the one shooting than the one shot. Like, I yeah. absolutely understand that perspective. Um, but at the same time, um, police officers are out there in body armor. Yeah, they're way more prepared for... Let me put it this way. When a cop comes up and knocks on my window, mm -hmm. they're more prepared for a fight than I am. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm and believe me, like I, that's not something I take lightly. Like I'm I'm just as fearful for my life when they come knock on that door as they are of me. Yeah. Like I mean that's just the reality. Like mm -hmm. and and maybe I'm overly afraid of police, but that's how I feel. Yeah. I I don't <laughs> I can't say that you are. I don't know. Maybe, but I I wouldn't I yeah. wouldn't make that accusation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, one of the things that I, I was thinking about as these officers were saying, you know, it makes me not want to be on the force or I may not return to the force after this because I want to feel like I'm protected by the, the legal apparatus. Yeah. First off, my thought is that, well, you already are. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> it, it's been made very clear. There's been a few cases that have gone the other way over the last couple of years yeah. uh, because they were very politically charged, I think. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, uh, history would say that you are already protected by the apparatus. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, uh, but the other thing is Honestly, that... Honestly, though, any, uh, my feeling on that is if you feel like you need to be protected that much from the apparatus, like by, then maybe you don't need to be out there. Yeah. I kind of welcome you leaving the force. Well, and that's what I was going <laughs> to add is that, uh, you know, maybe this will, f will, um, Weed some of the bad some seeds out. Well, that too. Um, but I was thinking maybe it would accelerate some of the things that we would like to see. Yeah. When you talk about defunding the police, like what when when the um, the people that are talking about defunding the police talk about defunding the police, they don't mean the same thing as us. Yeah. Um, now, if there aren't enough willing police officers to provide the protection that the public feels like it deserves, there's going to be a lot of sectors of the public that hire private protection. Yeah. Uh, homeowners associations, uh, business associations, etc. And that's what I would like to see policing kind of shift into anyway. Yeah. Is privatized policing. 
where you're, and those people will absolutely be held accountable oh, yeah. for any kind of mistakes. And I think that that results in a, a more um, even handed, just <coughs> uh, group of police. Oh, I'd absolutely think so. So um, that I see as the upside of this is that, that, okay, people start leaving the force and then the market reacts to that. That fills that hole. Yeah. Um, and it, it fills the hole with uh, a group of people that can provide security, but also will be held accountable for their actions. Yeah. And will therefore, and know that they will be held accountable for their actions and will therefore be more careful about the actions that they take. Absolutely. Which is what we all want. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, I don't have anything else on that, really. Yeah. Uh, I just, I, I thought it was an important, it, an important subject to at least discuss some of the ramifications. Yeah. Um, well, that was, um, it's weird. Like, I haven't really heard much on the um, mainstream media about that. And I haven't consumed a lot of news this week either. So yeah. it could have been out there and I just missed it. But um, until you said something the other day, or I think your mom actually said something, mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize that that case was finishing up. Yeah, m my mom was watching the case the whole time, like, yeah. uh, and so she, she'd she been tracking it, and she's the one that pointed out to me that it was ending. Yeah. I mean, I knew that it was going on, but I wasn't following it. Yeah. So, thanks, Mom. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. All right, so on to the next thing, uh, and this is just like a general, I guess, general government corrupt activity stuff <laughs> yeah. um but i i don't think that i, I this certainly isn't something that a lot of people are talking about and so here's some news that you may not know yeah. um to set the scene uh if you'll recall over the last couple of years um the government has uh put a lot of money into pandemic relief um something like 3.4 trillion dollars of taxpayer money has gone out in various little payoffs to people yeah. and uh you may also remember that we were talking about this at the time um that a lot of this stuff was being approved by congress and uh pointed out that um if you took the maximum amount of money that they were sending to any individual and you applied it to every individual in the united states yeah it came up to less than half of what they were spending. Yeah, yeah. So where's all of this other money going? Yeah. So um, first off, of course, <laughs> that was a, an exaggeration to begin with because not every individual in this country got money. And even the ones that did didn't get all of the money possible that they could could have sent you out in direct payments. Yeah. Right? So um, the amount of money that went towards things other than the individual's to help support them through the pandemic as the government shut down the economy, um, it was actually far less than half of what they spent. Yeah. All right. So um, I recently heard a report that they uh, were aware were aware of something like 3% of that total amount of money um, had been scammed away. Uh, now, 3% doesn't sound like a lot, except when you're talking about $3.4 trillion. That means it was over $100 billion of taxpayer money yeah. that went to the wrong place. That number shocked me when you told me that earlier. Like, that's a, like when you say 3%, like I knew it was going to be a lot because mm -hmm. you're talking about such a big number anyway. But to, um, to put it in those type of terms, but you expect, I mean, honestly, when, when you're talking about the government, you expect the government to, to, have that much just like through fraud, yeah, like general I mean, waste and abuse, general you know? waste. Yeah, like you've got to build at least three percent. And I mean, I would have mm -hmm. probably put it closer to five percent mm -hmm. because just because yeah. government's not well, it could efficient. be a lot more than this number. That's what they think, though. Yeah. yeah, um, and it probably is more than that because I mean, I'm sure it was the government pulling those numbers anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think that they've recovered something like three percent of that. Well, there's been, um, I've seen just a few things here and there um, where they've been aggressively trying to like well, catch sort this. sort of. Well, I mean, they say aggressively, but the but the truth is, is the government is fighting for money anywhere it can get it right well, now. That's true. So, I mean, they're trying to get it through taxes. They're trying to get it through um, minimizing waste, like mm. anything they can do to generate more money for the government. Well, it depends on what you mean by minimizing waste, I would say. Well, yeah. I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> well, when I say, I, I don't even really mean minimizing waste. I mean, just 
fixing loopholes and stuff yeah, like that. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so even if they've recovered three billion of this hundred billion um, yeah. that's been lost, and this is, so this includes things like um, them just sending it to the wrong person or yeah. place, yeah. like the government just screwing up and sending it, you know, so where it wasn't supposed it to yeah. go. Yeah. Um, and it includes also, uh, you know, fraudulent claims and so forth. Um, you know, claims that people were making against the government, fraudulent PPP loans, etc. Yeah. All right. Um, so, and I guess the thing that I most want to point out about this is we're talking about money issues, um, is that, uh, there is a direct line between this and price inflation. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I talk about this constantly, but like the, because inflation's a big deal right now. That's something you talk to anybody on the street, they're going to be like, yeah, mm-hmm. everything is going up and I see it. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of people aren't making the connection of why that is. I mean, you have to look back at the past two years and the amount of money that's just been printed and put into the system. Yeah. Like you can't expect that money, even if you don't know anything about economics, if you can't expect to print a bunch of money, put it in the system and everything to stay like it was. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, inflation of the monetary supply, um, it, it seems like it would be a very easy, logical step for people to make to say inflation of the monetary supply will result in price inflation. Yeah. The more money is out there, the more money will be charged for goods and services. Yeah. It's just it's just the facts of life. <laughs> and and one of the best examples I can think of is um, the student loan system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the student loan system has been monopolized by the federal government for some time now. Yeah. And um, it has resulted in a huge uh, cost increase for colleges and universities. Yeah. Um, when I was when I was young, uh, you could go to as an in-state resident, you could go to a state university for a, a few hundred dollars a semester. Yeah, yeah. It is nowhere close to that. Oh now. yeah, no, nowhere near. Um, and in fact, in in a lot of state universities, you are going to be paying as much uh, for tuition as I paid at a private university when I went to college. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, and a big and, and and actually, I think the driving factor, like the driving factor, that now everything's a little bit more nuanced than that. There's more yeah. going on than just this one thing. But uh, I think the primary driving factor of that increase in tuition costs is just the amount of um, of loans that the U.S. government puts out, guaranteed student loans that the government puts out. Yeah. And and think of it like this: um, as any person should be able to understand, I think, if the government is offering up to $10,000 a semester. I'm, now I'm pulling these numbers out of thin yeah, air. Yeah. This may not be the exact numbers. Yeah. In fact, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but if as the, an example. Yeah, as an example. If the government is offering up to $10,000 a semester in guaranteed loans um, for students to go to college, yeah. as a college... Why would you ever charge less than ten thousand dollars a semester? Yeah, no reason to, because the government just leaving government money, guaranteed government money on the table. Yep. If you do. Yeah. Um, and then of course the what it becomes is that you try and draw as many students as you can to guarantee as much money as you can. Yeah. So you're taking that money, and instead of building your academic programs, I mean, I'm sure some schools are building their academic programs, but the best way to draw better, like uh, more and more students, is through amenities, yep. better food, better facilities, you know, swimming pools, tennis courts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Absolutely. game rooms, whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, those are how you you get. 18 year olds to agree to come to your college. Right? Exactly. Like, yeah. Um, so uh, on, on the whole. Yeah. And, uh, so you're not even improving the quality of education with all this money out there. All you're doing is improving the, the, um, the, how um, much fun it is to be in college. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was trying to think of, uh, like, um, uh, what are those, uh, like a resort. You're, you're building yeah. a resort for, <laughs> for kids. Exactly. Um, and, uh, and that's not, not valuable. And speaking of colleges, then, so at, like after hearing this report about the um, hundred billion dollars that was scammed away, um, then I heard this report, and I'm going to play a clip for you. You know, federal pandemic relief aid has enabled the U.S. Department of Education to make significant investments in under-resourced schools, including many historically black colleges and universities. 
more than 20 HBCUs are using those stimulus funds to help alleviate students' financial burden by paying outstanding tuition and fees, giving them a fresh start. Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia, was one of the first HBCUs to do so. We're committing $5 million, assisting nearly 2,000 students with account balances. We are reinventing the college experience so that our students can graduate nearly debt-free. Students we talked to said they were stunned and relieved by the unexpected financial assistance. A lot of students were contemplating how they were going to start fresh, come up with thousands of dollars. With that announcement, that definitely allow some students to just breathe. So we're seeing a lot more movement here and it's taking hold in many schools. We have a lot more on cbc.com slash invest in you. Okay. So I'm pretty sure that this is not included in this hundred billion dollars of scammed away money, yeah. but I don't see it as much different. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't see it as much different either. And I, I, it just boggles my mind. What were they sending this money to these universities for anyway? Like, I mean, they said pandemic relief, but yeah. I mean, I, I I suspect that the the idea, if I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, is something like, um, you know, to help fund their transition to doing more school online, online and things stuff. like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that the U.S. government had in mind that they would just uh, pay off student debts and buy students computers and, you know, things like that. I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm not really sure. And I haven't been able to verify this, but I also heard um, a bit of a report, and I, I couldn't go back to it, um, that suggested that some of these universities were also doing things like just doing direct deposits into students' accounts, or maybe they were discussing doing yeah. direct deposits into students' accounts of up to $10,000 for the kids to just do with what they want. <laughs> yeah, all right. Just, <laughs> you know. And how do you think an 18, 19 year old is going to respond yeah. to 10 grand just popping in their account? <laughs> a new car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, you can make the best financial decisions <laughs> with this. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, and, and this, just to, you know, keep hammering the point, this is taxpayer money. Yeah. This is what they're doing with your money. Yeah. Um, they're shutting down your businesses, they're taking your money away, and they're giving it to these universities that are then just giving it away to these kids. And it may even be a circular thing where um, they're using taxpayer money to pay <laughs> off debts that are made with taxpayer money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Pretty soon there will be no economy except for the government. The government will just be paying off itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, none of us will have anything to do with any of it except that they will draw that money away from us somehow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it, it's an, it, like nothing I've ever seen, man. Yeah. Um, but just remember, like when we talk about taxpayer money, like that's, that's money they're using to inflate and devalue. Like, because mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like they have this money. It's not like that we're, it's not like the federal government is operating off of a surplus. And so right. they're giving us that money back. Like, that's not what's happening here. Um, I might feel differently about it if it was, probably not a lot differently, but at least differently. But this money is being printed. Like, it's just money printer yeah. go burr. Like, I mean, that's what's happening here. Yeah. And that's the reason that the prices are going up. And like I say, people are feeling that right now more than ever. And it's not going to, it's not stopping. Mm. Like, I mean, it's, they're already projecting into next year that this is going to keep continuing. And I see it every day. Like, I work in retail. Like, it's, it's no joke, man. Yeah. Well, in the, uh, you know, to try and give some perspective, that $3.4 trillion in pandemic relief. Three point four trillion is on the average what the U.S. government generates in revenue and for all, you know, all taxes. Yeah, yeah, um, right. <laughs> and uh, and of course that's in years when they don't shut down half the businesses in the U.S. Well, yeah, and and you got to figure that's this is on top of what they were already going to spend anyway. So it's yeah. not like this is their budget for the year. <laughs> yeah, and and actually while we're on the subject, um, the. You heard about the stuff between Elon Musk and uh, Elizabeth Warren? A little bit, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, she's, you know, uh, attacking him for not paying any taxes and being one of the richest people around and just being a parasite. Yeah. Whereas her entire income is b based <laughs> on taxes yeah. collected, which... How she could even say that with a straight I, face I is just it's beyond like, me. Who is the parasite here? Like, right. she's... Uh, 
All right. There's no reason to point that out any further. Like that should be clear to everybody listening. <laughs> yeah. But um the the other the other part first off, he's like I pay plenty in taxes. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Um but you keep talking about you keep hearing this talk about well, you know, rich people don't pay their fair share, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um you got to think about how much tax revenue they generate. Yeah. Like, and I don't just mean the taxes they pay off of their income and their well, investments and their businesses, just but all, all the people that they employ. Well, that's what I was supposed <laughs> to say. You've got to look outside just what they give the IRS every year. Mm-hmm. Like, you've got to look at what their money is doing throughout the economy. Right. Um, whether it be buying stuff or just like you're saying, running their business and paying people. I mean, you got to figure that business on top of having all the employees and all of the money that's generated and paid out through them, all of the stuff they're buying, all the stuff that they're doing. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, that money is in the economy. Um, It's just there, you know? Yeah. I mean, you could make a pretty strong argument that every dollar in taxes paid by an employee of Tesla. Yeah. Is is, Elon Musk's contribution. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Easily. (laughs) Like, you know? So, um, I, I don't know. I just get... (laughs) <laughs> I actually heard somebody talking to, I think it was Dave Ramsey, actually. Um, I was listening to an interview with Dave Ramsey, so I think this came from that. And he was talking about, well, you know, it kind of depends on what you think is fair, right? Um, he's And he was saying, where I come from, fair would be everybody pays the same percentage. Yeah. And he said, fair could be that uh, nobody pays anything. And I was like, that's the <laughs> that's the boat that I'm on right there. Yeah, that's, the, that's what I think is fair. <laughs> yeah, I think every every dollar that the government steals from me in taxes is unfair. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And everybody else, too. I don't want somebody else to take up that burden. I want the government to stop spending money and stop taking mine. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I can manage my money just fine by myself. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, but anyway, all right. Um. Do you want to hit anything else on that? I know you like no. the economic stuff, so I yeah you know, no I'm, I'm pretty well good, but want. like I say, that was yeah. All right, um, well now <laughs> we're back to coronavirus. There's yeah. no avoiding it. It's still in the news. Well, There's, it's still affecting our lives. Like, yeah. I mean, that's the bottom line. Like, yeah. I mean, if as long as long as it's gonna as long as the government reaction is affecting us, mm-hmm. because that's where we're at. Like, I mean, we're beyond the virus being a problem. Yeah. It's it's the government reaction to the virus that's mm-hmm. the problem. Mm-hmm. I was actually um, I was at the pharmacy today, and while I was waiting in line, there were some people waiting for vaccines, and I was listening to them talk about it. And uh, they were like the three people that were sitting there waiting to get vaccines were all saying that they didn't really want to get the vaccine. Yeah. Um, and that they were concerned about what the vaccine would do to them. Yeah. And uh, but that they were getting the vaccine and it was boosters for all, I think. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, and uh, but that they were doing it because uh, of. In in order to live their lives as normally as possible. And one of them was saying, and this is the point where I almost started (laughs) lecturing. Um, One of them said, well, you know, I'm just ready for all of this, you know, to get through all of this and get back to normal. And I was ready to say, then you need to not take the vaccine and just say no to all of this. Yeah. Um, because and compli- get back to normal. <laughs> yeah, compliance is not going to get you out of this. No, no. Um, Man, so- that's such a good point too. Because and and I hear it all the time, but it's so true. Like compliance will not get a it, just like what you said. Like mm-hmm. compliance will not. You can't comply your way out of this. Yeah. Like, and we've seen that. Like, I mean. People, people like us have been saying this for a while, mm-hmm. but like the evidence is all out there. The more we comply, the worse it gets. Mm-hmm. Like because it's not getting better. It's not like like everybody got the vaccine in the first round and now it's like okay, now we can go back to normal. No, yeah. that more and more restrictions. I mean, they took the mask away for just briefly and then was like, oh well, we gotta go back to that. Like it's it, it's not going to end. Mm-hmm. I just want to remind everybody that almost two years ago. Uh, the, the first request of us was to lock down for two weeks to flatten the curve. Yep. Two weeks to flatten the curve. Yeah. Where are we at now? It's been a long two weeks. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so, uh, now Omicron is the big thing. The, the, the final push. I hope it's the final push anyway. It has Um, to be. The, every, every indicator is that this Omicron is, is the weakest (laughs) variant that it could be. Well, Somehow we are 
supposed to be very, very... What in the world was that? I don't know. I heard something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, somehow, we are supposed to be very, very afraid of yeah. all of this still. Um, and uh, so, to hopefully help alleviate some of that, yeah. I've got a clip from the BBC of an interview with the health minister... Um, I can't remember her name now. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm so terrible with names. I'm sorry, people. Um, but uh, anyway, this is the health minister of the UK being interviewed, and this is what she has to say. Can you just tell us at this stage, how many people are in hospital this morning with Omicron? Um, there's 774 in hospital. Oh, sorry, that's uh, that's total hospital, yeah, hospitalizations in the last seven days. With Omicron, there's 10 cases um, with Omicron. Maybe going up to 11, actually. That, that wasn't confirmed yet, but I think probably gone up to 11. How many deaths? Uh, the deaths um, were 100 and... Oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't have the actual From figure, Omicron? But... Oh, From Omicron. Omicron. Oh, sorry, sorry, Kay. Uh, no, we don't have. Um, we've had one death uh, with Omicron so far. Just and how many of those ten Omicron. people with Omicron are on ventilators? I don't think there's anybody that I'm aware of on a ventilator with Omicron. Okay, uh, Professor Whitty saying people should be. So, so what you're getting at is the severity of the. You're getting no, at the severity asking, of the I'm disease, just which, the is, fact, which is that's one all, of the unknowns. There's ten people in hospital. One yeah, of them okay. died. The other ten are not yeah. on ventilators. That's those are facts. Yeah. Jillian Keegan. That's her name. Ah. Jillian Keegan. <laughs> nice. Um, but <laughs> I think, okay, I think my favorite part of that is at the end when um, the health minister is saying, well, you get that the severity of the disease is one of the unknowns. Like, this is a point that she absolutely has to make in this interview, <laughs> right. is yeah. that the severity is one of the unknowns. And I like that the reporter, the interviewer, pushes back and says, uh, okay, but one death, ten 10 hospitalizations. hospitalizations, none of whom are on ventilators. Those are facts. Yeah, yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> Those are facts. Um, and I, I also find it interesting uh, in the um, in the interview when she says, when she's asked about deaths. And of course, every time she's asked about one of these things, she goes to this big number first. Yeah. And, yeah. and it has to be clarified. Oh, oh, you meant Omicron. Oh, yeah, this is what we're talking about. This, this is, is what, what we're, we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but when uh, she says uh, deaths with Omicron, and she says, oh, yes, deaths with Omicron, uh, one death with Omicron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, she actually emphasizes that. Yeah. With. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which suggests to me that they probably didn't die from <laughs> Omicron. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, if, if you're out there and you're still scared about Omicron, this is a month into this in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, to to say that we don't know what we're going to get into with Omicron is just laughable. I would think at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, I mean, sure. Early on, the indicators were that this wasn't going to be so bad. That the Omicron was going to be weaker, mm -hmm. but more contagious. Um, and we didn't know all of that for sure. But I a month then, I'm we pretty well know now. Like, I mean, this is not as deadly as it. It's not as deadly as the the Delta or the previous variants. Mm -hmm. Like the, for this variant to take over would be a blessing. Yeah, um, and is a blessing because it is even here locally um, cases are on the rise. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, my wife works in the medical field. Like it's true. Like cases are on the rise right now, but um, severity is down immensely right now, even here locally. So I mean, that's that's something to to be excited about. Yeah, and nobody's reporting this as good news for some reason. No, no. I mean, you I say for some reason, like I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, we know what, what they're is, doing. I mean, we know what the game is. I mean, the game is to get people scared and, and people riled up as much as you can. Yeah. Um. um well, I, I I want to I want to tell a story. All right. <laughs> Here. Story time. Um. So I really wish that I had looked more into this before. Um. But, uh, of course, the, the Nuremberg trials were held after World War II. Um, and uh, one of the things that they talked about was uh, medical experimentation on captives. Yeah. Or, I don't know, I guess unwanted even, persons. Even, yeah, even like, their, their citizens and whatnot, too, mm, right? I mean, I, yeah. yeah. Um, because both uh, the Germans and the Japanese um, performed terrible 
medical experiments on uh, on on captives that they had. Yeah. Um, and uh, just as a side note, uh, the U.S. hired a lot of those people at the end of the war into their own medical services or yeah. you know scientific. Uh, yeah. Military I mean, science I, stuff. I've I've always heard NASA was full of them. I don't know if there's anything to that. Yeah, well, it wasn't the guys that were doing terrible medical experiments well, that no, NASA no, hired but, on. Yeah, but, but they were still like we we took the best of the best regardless of where they came from. Yeah, and what they were doing, and tried to take advantage of the information that they had had, had gleaned. Had learned, yeah. And of course, um, I I read this uh, really great book. Um, I can't remember the title now, but the subtitle was America's Poisoner in Chief about Sidney Gottlieb, yeah. um, who uh, was um, a big part of the CIA's medical experiments into LSD and various other chemicals, uh, the MK Ultra stuff, and you know, lo- lots of terrible things that the U.S. did in terms of experimenting on people, sometimes prisoners, yeah. definitely people without consent, without knowing what was going on yeah. um, after World War II. After yeah. the Nuremberg trials and after the development of the Nuremberg Code, yeah. uh, which is what I kind of want to talk about now. Yeah. Um, so the the first point of the Nuremberg Code, while it applies to uh, in the context of the Nuremberg Code, it applies to prisoners of war and and other captives. Yeah. Um, essentially, uh, it has been adopted as just like a basic medical ethics. Doctrine. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And uh, so the very first point, I did you bring Corona you, over here again? <laughs> again. Man. Um, so the very first point on here is about voluntary consent. And I'm, I'm it's kind of long, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Although I, I recommend people look it up because I say it's kind of long. It's kind of long for the podcast. It's not really that long. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, there are some important points to emphasize here, I think. Um, just in the first, the very first statement, which is uh, the voluntary, voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion. Now, I will go on from here, but I want to play a clip. <laughs> All right, um, because let me let me read that one part again. A uh, person should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion. Now, to Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago. All right. If you have been living without having a vaccination, it's time for a change. If you wish to live life as normally as possible, with the ease to do the things that you love, you must be vaccinated in the city of Chicago starting January 3rd. This health order may pose an inconvenience to the unvaccinated. And in fact, it's is inconvenient by design. Now, Liberty Larry. Yeah. <laughs> would you say that her making it a point that being inconvenient to your life is a primary purpose of these restrictions might be considered a form of constraint or coercion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To say the least, I would say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's absolutely insane, man. Mm-hmm. Like, and what people's got to remember is like, this is a medical decision. Like I keep hearing people play it down. It's like, Oh, well, it's just a shot. It's just a shot. You just got to get the shot. And it's like, yeah, got to get the shot. Like it's still, it's not, it's a medical decision that you, that should not be taken lightly. Like it's, this isn't something to just do to be compliant. Mm-hmm. Like this is your health you're talking about. Yeah. You know, and and maybe it's the right decision for some, and maybe it's not, and that's between you. But that's the to have the government try to step in and be this forceful, um, and the government at every level. I mean, this is local government for people who live in Chicago. Mm. Like this is your local. Like we don't have this problem here locally where we're at, but for the people in Chicago, like this is your local government saying you're going to do this one way or the other. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, we we will force you to do this by dismantling your life until you have no choice. Exactly, exactly. And uh, I, 
I can't believe that people, I can't believe that large swaths of people put up with this. Yeah. It's beyond my understanding. I, and I, I tell you, like even little things for me drive me crazy. I, um, I can't tell you how frustrated I was when my, uh, my brother's family got off the plane and my four year old nephew is wearing a mask. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's just uh, and a cloth mask at that. So even if masks did anything, which they don't. Yeah. And even if masks did anything on a plane, which they absolutely don't. Yeah. Um, that then, mask wasn't <laughs> amongst the ones that would. Yeah. yeah. And so and and he, my brother even said to me at one point, well, it's no big deal to him because he has to wear a mask in in preschool. And pretty much the entire time that he's been in preschool, he's had he's to wear had a mask. to wear a mask in school. Uh, I tell you, man, I think years down the road we're gonna find that that these masks cause plenty of health problems alone. Yeah. Beyond anything else, um, and maybe I'm wrong about that. And I kind of hope I am wrong about mm-hmm. that, but. I know the the times when I've been forced to wear a mask in situations like it is like I can feel my heart rate go up. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, there's it's not I mean, maybe, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's not everybody. But no, I, it does the same thing for me. Uh, like, that's that's how I my body reacts when I can't breathe. Yeah, it, it restricts my breathing to, to a degree where it's noticeable to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't do it the, now. Well, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I, except except I did when I was in an airport, too. Yeah. Well, you have to. I mean, mm. it's either you're going to fly or you're not going to fly. You yeah. Know? And so. New Jersey is a long drive, man. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> long drive. So. Um, and, uh, you know, Libertarian Convention in Reno yeah. this year. Uh, <laughs> going to be a lot of Libertarians driving. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> or a lot of Libertarians throwing off of planes. I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. That, you I may, would love to see that. Dude, that may be what ends up happening. You, yeah. made, you made a good point there. <laughs> yeah. We had to have a, a virtual convention again because, uh, you know, half of the people that were going to attend got thrown off got their flights. Per- yeah. Got permanently <laughs> banned from flying. <laughs> <sighs> That would be nice to see. Like I, I would be perfectly content with doing a, a virtual convention if, if it was that because was of the that. reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, man. Um, so uh, let let me continue on with the uh, this point in, about voluntary consent in the Nuremberg Code, though. Um, so the next phrase, uh, and should have the person, of course, um, should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. This latter element requires that before the acceptance of an affirmative decision by the experimental subject, there should be made known to him the nature, duration, and purpose of the experiment. Um, the method and means by which it is to be conducted all inconveniences and hazards reasonably to be expected, and the effects upon his health or person which may possibly come from his participation in the experiment. All right. So that that seems fair. Although they have made it a point that they are playing down the potential side effects of these vaccines all over the place. And in fact, if you talk about them in some places, your posts or whatever get taken away. We were talking about that before we went on air tonight. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, you about, uh, at least on Facebook, uh, Facebook's the platform I'm on the most. Mm -hmm. Um, You just can't mention this stuff, not in the, in any kind of negative light or your post will be removed or shadow banned. I mean, I've got a list of bands going down. (laughs) Like, (laughs) like, so, I mean, that's just the reality. Okay. And, uh, and just to, Reiterate a little bit before I play the next clip. Yeah. Um, should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. Uh, that uh, the um, nature, duration, and purpose of the experiment and the method and means and all inconvenience and hazards to be reasonably expected should be made known. Yeah. All right. So um, then I, I hope that some of you have have seen this clip and st- you know we're on a uh, audio only medium here so yeah. um you don't get to see this but uh to set it up um there's a woman that goes into her pharmacy cvs as it turns out from what the pharmacist says yeah. um the asking for the insert uh for the vaccines yeah um, so that she can read the studies um or or read the studies that they're citing yeah to affirm the the safe uh, safety of the vaccine yeah and so it this is this is fun because you get to watch the the uh pharmacist kind of wake up yeah he <laughs> as it goes he, he learns as things go along here <laughs> yeah. like it's a learning experience for everyone so um we we may play this all at once we may split it up uh we'll decide as we go all right 
That's from the Moderna vaccine. Okay, Moderna. Is it the same for um, Pfizer and all of the others? There, no, the, each brand is a little different. Okay, so uh, may I take this with me for to look at all of the safety studies, placebo safety studies on this? Yeah, because yeah, because the, yeah, the one because the one that we give. Um, yeah, because the one the one that's given to patients doesn't contain that information. So that. Which one is are they giving if it's not so, this one? So no, no, that's the one. That is the one we are giving. Oh, okay. But yeah, the 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 package insert given to patients isn't the full information. So it's not the from the manufacturer that, themselves. Th th that is from the manufacturer, but it's truncated. That's okay. the full thing. So why is it intentionally in blank if it's all the safety studies? Inside? It's a, they're inside. They're inside of it. And this folds up. Okay. Just to point out here, this is the moment where he opens up the insert where all the studies are on the inside and realizes that it is also blank. <laughs> it just, is also blank. Since you can't see what's happening, well, just so you know what's going on. Right and it's worth moment. noting that he mentions the, the placebo um, test groups and whatever. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about on this podcast, they ended up in the end vaccinating all of those folks. Oh, right. There is no placebo group because they ended up vaccinating the placebo group. So yeah. there's no control group on these. I didn't catch anymore. that the first time around, but he mentions the placebo group mm -hmm. when he's talking. Yeah. And, well, and she is, t she's talking yeah. about, you know, the placebo or the, um, One control of them studies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, all right, all right. Back to the clip. All right. I've got to get online and find it. No, it's okay. It's okay. I already know that it's intentionally like my last question is, um, how is it informed okay. consent when okay. all of the safety studies, placebo safety studies right. are not listed from the manufacturer? That that's a great question. Okay. I would talk, okay. I, I would talk to, I would talk to CVS about that because okay. Um, so if, if we don't know what we're injecting into ourselves, um, I don't understand how that's informed consent. That you're, you're, ex you're exactly right. Okay. And you're exactly right. Yeah. And you are correct. I should not be giving these vaccines at all. Okay. Oh, why are you giving them? Because I am, because I am told to, and that's how, I, because I am told to, and I am told. I understand and, that. And, I, and everything I have shown, including the patients that I have given it to, uh -huh. It is safe. It is safe and effective. Of what it studies are you going by that states that it's safe and effective? I know these are tough questions, but I have to ask. I know, and I and I'm sorry, but but you can't you can't I, answer. So I, I understand I, that. I, I I unfortunately cannot answer that, okay. and I feel it. And right right now, I'm I'm feeling totally inadequate. I was just following orders, he said. Yeah. As another parallel what, what, to Nuremberg. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure there's some parallels there, too, I've heard once or twice. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> another part that I like there is when he just says, yeah, I should not be giving these vaccines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh and she, yeah well this because is... but it boils down to a bigger point so mm -hmm. like the guy giving the vaccine like he clearly is like wow i do not know enough about this to be doing it mm -hmm. um but that's everybody like yeah. that's it, it's not like this is the this one guy is like oh wow like i didn't apparently i didn't do enough research on this mm -hmm. like everybody that's given them like it's not i mean i'm not saying everybody there's plenty of doctors and stuff that's looked into this fully i'm sure but not enough yeah. Like, I mean, I guarantee you as far as at least pharmacies go, pharmacists go, mm -hmm. like that's what you're going to get 90% of the time probably. Yeah, you're probably right. And actually when you mentioned it during when we cut the clip in two afterward that as we were listening to the rest, I thought, I wonder if that's why they don't list the placebo studies is because they don't really exist anymore. No, no, they don't. Um, now, uh, they did com quote unquote complete the study yeah. um, before – you know, well, before they started vaccinating people, you don't have any long, you can't do any long term complete, placebo. complete, not, I mean, completed as far as what they're going to mm -hmm. do for this vaccine at this point. But yeah. generally, these vaccines go 10 years of studies. Yeah, or close to. Close yeah. to it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the norm. So to say that mm -hmm. that this is absolutely safe and effective, I mean, they, nobody can say that with certainty at this point. Yeah. Well, uh, let me also, um, in bringing Fauci in a little bit here, uh, let me also point out that completing a study um, isn't doesn't really mean much because sometimes they stop studies early because they already know that if they continue them, yeah, 
um, that they'll get results that they don't want to publish. Yeah. And uh, Fauci has been part of at least two of these. Yeah. Um, one, a, a long time, again, I go back to the article, Sense of Omission, yeah. um, you know, where they did the AZT studies and they knew that long term uh, the AZT um, ended up killing more people than it saved. Yeah. And so what they did was they ran studies right up until the point where it starts to shift. Yeah, yeah. And they cut the studies off at, I, I, I want to say it was like four months or something like that. Yeah. Um, because they knew that if they continued studies beyond four months, they would start to see negative results. Yeah. And they didn't want to publish negative results. So they cut the studies off intentionally at the point at which it starts to become more of a problem than a savior. Yeah. Um, they did the same thing with remdesivir at the beginning of this pandemic. Yeah. Um, where they knew that if that long term use of remdesivir resulted in death because they'd been using it for Ebola. Yeah. And it was killing like half of the patients that used it, I think beyond five days or something like that, died. Oh, wow. Now, Ebola is a dangerous a dangerous disease. So, you know, yeah. you can't necessarily separate. Um, but they were cutting studies short of remdesivir before they started recommending it for, uh, for coronavirus. Yeah. And, um, and they were cutting them short because they knew that long-term use of remdesivir results in death. And yeah. now as they, as time has played out here, yeah. um, people who have been treated with remdesivir, something like a quarter of the patients that took it for more than five days died. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> coronavirus doesn't kill that many people yeah uh, i tell you it it really just feels like fauci just has this this trick he likes to use and this is how he does it yeah that guy's full of that guy's full of it yeah. i mean i i how anybody trusts that man at this point is just beyond my understanding yeah. and um and actually like while i'm thinking about it i recommend that people go to the their tom woods episode 2032 i think it was his most yeah. recent episode right as of the recording of this podcast i think okay. um is an interview with uh, robert f kennedy junior okay I, um, I about his book uh, on fauci yeah and um man he talks about some stuff that fauci was involved in that just like hearing him tell tell the story made me cry yeah like the man is terrible yeah. Not RFK. Yeah. Fauci. Fauci, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, say what you want about RFK. Like, this book is highly cited. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's like Fool's Errand from Scott Horton. Like, every yeah. every page has a uh, This guy, this guy knows his stuff, and he's not afraid yeah. to... to I mean, he backs up what he's claiming with, with yeah. research. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, the... Oh, I got off track there. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, there, there's there's a reason to doubt these people. There's a reason to doubt these vaccines. Um, well, there's at least reason to to be cautious. Yeah. Uh, like I say, I mean, I'm 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 not here to try to trash the vaccine or whatever. Like, make your own decisions. But I mean, I know what decisions I made. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I, the, there's. Um, and that clip ex illustrates like a really strong element of informed consent, which is supposed to be a part of this whole thing. Yeah. And, you know, just realize that your consent isn't that informed. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. Um, and I, I suppose we in there, <laughs> I, do, you, do you have anything more that you want to add? No. I feel like I had another point to make, but then I got talking about Fauci. I really despise that man. So um, <laughs> it kind of went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. I, I got lost. And uh, and and couldn't find my way back to whatever the point was that I was going to make. Oh, yeah. actually, I do remember the point that I was going to make. And I actually, I, I think this is the reason I thought of this at that point in time is because this is something that RFK was pointing out on the podcast, which I, I thought was interesting. Because we have made some kind of, um, uh, you know, glancing um, observations related to this, like some kind of tangential stuff, but hadn't put it in full perspective in the way that he did, which is that the U S and the UK had the highest death rates in the world yeah. from coronavirus at the beginning of this. And at the beginning of this, the U S and the UK were refusing to use hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, and they were pushing remdesivir. That's true. Whereas the lowest death rates in the world are in Africa. 
Yeah. Um, which isn't really well known for its great medical system. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> but in Africa, uh, they have high, uh, you know, this is the home of malaria and river blindness, which are things that are uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, almost the whole country is on hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the areas that have uh, high instances of river blindness, uh, a lot of people are on ivermectin. Yeah. So, so they were just that had these drugs in abundance and they're using them in <laughs> abundance anyway. Yeah. So, um, and of course we, you know, we did talk about how in India, um, they were giving out the blister packs with the ivermectin in it, yeah. um, for almost for free, like two bucks a pack or whatever. That was a 14 day regimen that included five days of ivermectin. If you thought that you'd been exposed to coronavirus and they had really low case rates, at least reported case rates until they banned the use of these packs. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then their case rates shot up and some regional governors brought the packs back and their caseloads went down. Yeah. Like so if nothing else, this should be something that like, why would you ignore? And we know the answer to this too. Yes, we do. But why would you ignore a drug that does seem to have like, you know, correlation is not causation, but yeah. that does seem to have some impact on the, I mean, the results if, of if the, the evidence is showing that illness. this is is doing something to help. Mm -hmm. Why would you not want to go down that path? If 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 health was what you were pushing, yeah. and if if st bettering people is what you're pushing, mm -hmm. the problem is is that's not what these pharmaceutical companies are in the business of. Yeah, they're not concerned with health; they're concerned with money. Exactly. And ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine are inexpensive. Exactly. And because we've talked about these things. This one will probably get dropped off of YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't expect it to be there long. <laughs> yeah, but well, keep um, it out of the show title in the description. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely, of course. <laughs> Somebody's gonna have to listen to it till the end. <laughs> till the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, no. Um, all right, so we'll wrap it up there. Um, we uh, let's see. No reason to think that we shouldn't be back in a week. Yep. Um, it'll be a new year, so happy new year, everyone. All right. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, in the meantime, uh, follow us on Facebook, uh, subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, um, like and share, like and share, like and share. Yeah. Um, the, you just don't understand how much that helps to just put it in front of more people. Yep. Um, you know, we think we're doing good. Uh, we're doing good stuff here. And if you're listening, you probably do too. So wouldn't you want other people to know the things that you know? Absolutely. Or maybe you just like being the smartest guy to party. I don't know. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, like and share. Uh, tell your friends, and um, and we'll keep doing this. And so we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short. Live free. Ciao. Later. Mm -hmm.